Good evening, friends. President Dr. Arup, immediate past president Dr. Babu, scientific committee chairman uh, Dr. Rajiv, senior faculty members, dear friends. These orations are awarded to ophthalmologists who have significantly contributed to the development of ophthalmology. I presume this oration is awarded to me in recognition of my contribution to ophthalmology in the state as a postgraduate teacher for the last 41 years and contribution to KSOS as a scientific committee chairman and president of KSOS. Thank you KSOS for honoring me with this oration. Thank you Babu, thank you Bangesh and the executive committee members and all general body members of KSOS for honoring me with this oration. This is one of the most significant and momentous occasion in my professional career and I consider delivering this prestigious and meritorious oration as an incredible honor. Dr. C. Human has already been introduced to you by Dr. Rajiv. I am not going into the credentials. All, uh, ha all has been read by Dr. Rajiv. He was a multifaceted, multi-talented and multitasking ophthalmologist. The ultimate success of treatment is desired by the final visual outcome, which is determined by refraction. And refraction forms the basic foundation of examination in all ophthalmic subspeciality. But unfortunately, it's a dying art among the ophthalmologists. It is neglected by the postgraduate students during their postgraduate course, and the current generation of ophthalmologists shun away from refraction. And so we are too much dependent on the optometrist. Nowadays, among the ophthalmologists, this is done only by private practitioners attached to their homes, home clinics and optical shops. So I thought of sharing some of the practical guidelines to revive this dying art among the ophthalmologists. I have no financial interest in this presentation and unfortunately we had a long in, uh, the inaugural ceremony and I am standing between you and the much awaited cultural programs. So I will stick to my time. I have been allotted 30 minutes. This is my guru and mentor, the legendary professor Dr. K. S. Subramaniam. He used to remind us throughout our PG course that refraction is your bread and butter and cataract surgery fetches you an ice cream. Refraction is still my bread and butter. And I dedicate this oration to my beloved and respected professor Subramaniam sir. But there has been a paradigm shift in the younger generation of ophthalmologists and consultants now, where they consider cataract surgery is your bread and butter and bits and pieces of medical retina fetches you the ice cream and even the cake. The retinoscopy and autorefraction can unearth the amount of refraction, but whether to prescribe it or not, and if to prescribe, how much to prescribe, is the challenge to the practitioner. This is an art which is learned by years of practical experience. Now, why should an ophthalmologist learn refraction? Because it's an optometrist's job in, as like in the West. Your patients are more happy and satisfied if refraction is done by the treating doctor himself. For my last 41 years, this is the comment I hear from most of the patients. I went for glass correction. It was done by a technician. I am not happy and I am not happy the way it was done. So you should have the practical experience to point out errors done by the opticians you should be skillful to verify the refraction done by the optometrist and you should be confident to clear their doubts. And moreover, you have got a vicarious responsibility because the prescription is signed on your behalf. And you can fall back on your refraction skills whenever your surgical hands let you down later in your life. So it always you should aim to give comfortable vision rather than a super eagle vision. A comfortable 6-6 six, six parts or even 6-9 may be better than an uncomfortable 6-5. To start with, always do a pinhole test before subjective refraction, which, is because, which gives you the end point of maximum visual acuity attainable during a subjective refraction. I always do a preliminary full subjective refraction before I start examining the patient. The advantage is that I can minimize the indication for a subjective, for a cycloplegic retinoscopy and if your retinoscopy value tallies and the preliminary subjective refraction tallies, I can give the glasses that day itself without a PMT. On the other hand, 
it is not suited for preschool children mentally retarded and non cooperative patients and the other factor of accommodation playing a role in young patients can lead on to pseudo myopia and lot of errors so what will be the starting point of your subjective refraction you can get clues from the age and symptoms of the patient as for example a school going child with difficulty in seeing black body is usually a myope whereas a eye strain blurring of letters and running together and missing of letters may be astigmatism and the patient in the 40s who had a previous good vision now complaining of defective vision could be developing a manifest hypermetropia similarly an elderly hypermetrop now having can read without glasses he is developing index myopia due to cataract some the other clue you can get is from the acuity of vision some uh, for example a patient with a 618 may be having one diopter spherical power or a 636 may be having two diopter the denominator divided by 18 usually gives you the spherical power is an approximate one you can get clues from the examining the eye like a small disc in hypermetropia a large disc in myopia and oval disc in astigmatism the power of the present glass which is determined by neutralization or lensometer can give you some clues regarding starting of your subjective refraction but the most important factor is the tool nowadays is auto refractometer which is good for a rapid screening of refractive errors but the patient fixes for the target which is very close to his eyes and he the pseudo myopia is a major disadvantage leading on to over correction in myopia and under correction in hypermetropia and medial opacities if it is corneal or lens opacity gives you highly erratic values you cannot rely on that this may be good to find the axis of astigmatism don't blindly follow auto refractometry readings because no machine can replace human to human interaction it is unreliable in children without cycloplegia on the other hand a cycloplegic auto refraction is as good as a cycloplegic retinoscopy i said don't rely on auto refractor readings in children this child an 8 year old child who had 636 vision and based on auto refraction he was accepting minus 4.5 cylinder 90 degrees improving to 66 he could have easily prescribed it but the way he was reading the last two three lines he was struggling not clear so did a cycloplegic refraction and it came as plus 2 and minus 4.5 so this amount of hypermetropia was masked by the pseudo myopia by accommodation of the child so that's the importance of doing a cycloplegic retinoscopy in children should not be under the impression that this happens only in young children see the other 20 year old student who got his glasses changed where he was you already using a minus 3 point why he came with a complaint that he could not see now he has got eye strain and headache and based on the auto refraction without cycloplegia he was prescribed minus 1 sphere and 3.5 cylinder his symptoms worsened during near work and a cycloplegic retinoscopy was repeated he had only a cylindric error it was a minus 1 was accepted due to the pseudo myopia the other starting point is retinoscopy you can do a spot retinoscope or a, use a spot retinoscope or a streak retinoscope which gives you good values it is mandatory in preschool children and it is preferred in school children young adults high hypermetropia astigmatism and sorry amblyopia strabismus and it should be done as a first time refraction in myopes and if you have got a fluctuating auto refractometer values always do a sub, uh, cycloplegic retinoscopy cyclopentolate the effect of cyclopentolate is as comparable to atropine and that is a, that is preferred for routine cycloplegia in children one of the frequent mistakes we all make is unnecessarily prescribing low errors of refract uh, powers for spectacles like a 0.25 error it may be minus or plus it may be cylindrical or spherical because the patient comes to you and the technician or refractionist who does the initial work says patient has got 66 clearer with uh, minus 0.25 or plus 0.25 you do a uh, retinoscopy then go for a pmt the glass acceptance is equivocal but still it is written 66 more clear with minus 0.25 or plus 0.25 some degree or that and we end up in prescribing the glasses the patient returns after a month again with the same symptoms and what we have missed is aphoria so what we should do is always start examination by doing a proper cover test 
Don't start exam. The, nowadays, the tendency among the young ophthalmologists is to start examination with a slit lamp. They forget to do a basic assessment of orthoptic assessment with a cover test. So many a time, we see a lot of esophorias and exophorias causing eye strain and headache and other asthenopic symptoms. It's not the refractive error which is the cause. And if you have got the COVID pandemic, as you all have experienced, leading to the prolonged near work, there are a lot of patients with esophoria going into symptomatic intermittent diplopia and acquired concomitant esotropia, which has to be managed. On the other hand, prolonged near work, Patients with convergence insufficiency are having a lot of asthenopic symptoms and there are few patients who have developed acute exotropia for near. For these patients with convergence insufficiency, we can advise convergence in insufficiency exercises like the pencil push-up or the dot card or the dot cat exercises, which gives them good relief. It's not the 0.25 or plus 0.25 or minus 0.25 which is going to be a relief. Now moving on to the principles and correction of hypermetropia, in children below 3 years, you need to correct only if the error is more than 4.5. Whereas, if there is hypermetropia with esotropia, it should be corrected if the error is more than plus 1.5 or plus 2 diopters. But in the age group of 6 to 12, children, they are strenuously working at school, even small errors has to be corrected. And they should be advised constant wear if the error is more than 3 diopters. And if it is less than 3, they may be used for near work alone. But if the patient is having an accommodative convergence squint, a full cycloplegia correction has to be given before the cycloplegia wears off. As the hypermetropia decreases with age, refraction should be repeated every six months in a hypermetropic child and correction changed if necessary. This is very important. And if the near esotropia is more than 10 diop prism diopters, you may have to give a near add of plus 2.5 or 3. And in a child who is less than 5 years, you may give flat top bifocals or executive, whereas in older children, you can give progressives, with a, but with a transition zone higher than the standard adult fitting. But hypermetropia in the elderly, we entirely rely on manifest hypermetropia. There is no need to correct hypermetropia uncovered by cycloplegia. So there is no indication for cycloplegic refraction in a 40-year-old patient. The dictum is the strongest convex lens which gives you maximum vision. It's always better to do a fogging method to find out the manifest hypermetropia. All of you know how to do fogging. The principle is the denominator of the Snell lens should, notation should be doubled. So 6.9 becomes 6.18, 6.18 should be fogged to 6.36 and reduce the fog in steps of 0.25 or 0.5 to become 6.36 or 6.60. Now moving on to myopia. In children below 3 years, you, correction is needed only if the power is more than 3 diopters. Here the dictum is the weakest concave lens which gives you maximum vision. And full correction should be uh, given in children and adults below 30 years. And they should be advised to wear constantly for near and distance to avoid development of squint. <coughs> Do not undercorrect myopian children. There has been a tendency in the previous years to undercorrect myopia, but undercorrection produces a distance blur, it stimulates elongation of the eye and it leads to progression of myopia. On the other hand, you should not overcorrect myopia, probably the only indication may be intermittent exotropia. But undercorrection is indicated in adults above 30 years with a power more than 3 diopters and if they are wearing glasses for the first time. Initial undercorrection and then they may be given full correction. But if the myopia is more than 10 prism diopters, they are undercorrected by one or two diopters to avoid problems of near vision and minification of images. What is the endpoint of myopic subjective refraction? The letters in the chart should appear clear and sharp. It should not be smaller and dark. Smaller and dark means it becomes overcorrected. Many a time a myopic patient usually accepts an overcorrection because the, the letters become darker. An extra minus 0.25 may be unnoticed by a young myop, but it's a very bad mistake for a 40-year-old patient. Always do a duochrome test to know whether you have overcorrected or undercorrected in a myop. <coughs> if you see a myopic patient with the, the spectacle sagging towards the <coughs> tip of the nose, that means it's overcorrected. She is trying to adapt it because it is overcorrected. Ideally, it should be fitted very close to the eye. 
Once a myope, you are a lifetime myope unless you do a refractive surgery. Now, it has been postulated that currently there are about 30% of children in the 11 to 15 years of age group in the Indian scenario having myopia. And the projection is that by 2050, there will be about 64 million myopic children, which is amounting to 40 to 50 percent. So what are the interventions we can think about for slowing or progress the, preventing the progression of myopia? It could be environmental, pharmacological, peripheral defocus spectacles, multifocal spe contact lenses and orthokeratology lenses. The most important factor in preventing or slowing down the progression of myopia is increasing that outdoor activities and exposure to sunlight. Sunlight exposure has got a protective mechanism in myopia. With the high illumination outdoors and the illumination levels more than 1000 lux, which relaxes the accommodation, which decreases the pupillary size, it decreases the retinal blur and prevents elongation of the eye. The recommended outdoor exposure is 2 hours per day or approximately 10 to 12 hours per week which has been proven in various studies to decrease the progression of myopia. The longer wavelength light, blue light, has got a protective effect in preventing the progression of myopia. In the, some of the Asian countries like China, Hong Kong and Taiwan, they have gone on to glass classrooms to get exposure to sunlight during the class hours. The other factor in, uh, in progression of myopia is to in reduce the time for near work. Increase near work for more than 30 minutes produces larger accommodative lag with a high chance of myopia. Similarly, children with a closer reading distance less than 30 centimeters, there are five times more likely to be myopic. So the online classes during the COVID period has contributed to increase in incidence of myopia and progression of myopia. The next intervention which we can think about is pharmacological. The ATOM study and the LAMP study has proved that atropine 0.01 percentage at bedtime is very promising for prevention and progression of myopia. The exact mechanism is not known, but still it is regulating scleral or retinal growth. The third is giving peripheral defocus spectacles. This is a new concept which is coming up. The, the, the concept is that peripheral retinal perceptions are more important than the foveal perception in controlling the, in, in, uh, in the progression of myopia. If you see this picture on the right, the left, where it is emetropic, the foveal the rays and the peripheral rays are focused on the retina. Whereas the picture on the top in the middle, you see what is seen in myopia. The foveal rays are focused in front but the peripheral rays are focused behind because of the shape of the globe in myopia. It is supposed to be expansion is happening only in the posterior pole and equator, not in the periphery. We say it is a prolate shape, so the images are focused behind, just like in hypermetropia. So when you give a single vision lens, as is shown in the down picture there, the foveal rays, central rays are coming back to focus on the retina, but the peripheral rays are again projected back, producing a hypermetropic bl blur. But what is desired ideally is a glass which gives a foveal focus and a peripheral myopic blur. And based on this, few companies have come out with peripheral defocus spectacles. One is Myovision from Zs. They claim to produce about 30% uh, prevention in progression of, uh, reducing the progression of myopia. You have lenses, stellus lenses from Essilor based on Holt technology where it is supposed to uh, reduce the progression of myopia by about 67%. These lenses are not available in India now. But this is the Hoya lens, the Mio Smart spectacle lenses based on defocus incorporated multiple segments, DIMS, which is going to be available in India shortly. They claim about 62% in uh, pre uh, pro uh, prevention and in, in reducing the progression of myopia. The fourth one is multifocal contact lenses, which is very popular in the West. The MySight lenses are supposed to reduce the progression of myopia. Orthokeratology lenses, the ortho -K lenses, now with the new design, with a better fit in oxygen permeable material, with a myopic peripheral defocus, are becoming increasingly more popular, wearing in overnight use can flatten the cornea. This is becoming increasingly popular now in the West. 
Moving on to astigmatism, in children below 3 years, you need to correct only if the power is more than 2 diopters. Astigmatism less than 0.5 diopter need not be corrected if asymptomatic. But if you are correcting, give full correction in children. But in adults with high astigmatism, full correction is not tolerated initially, so under correction is better and full correction is given subsequently. Don't blindly change axis based on autorefractometer readings. Avoid minimal alteration of axis if worn successfully for some time. This is happening in many of these patients. So conventionally we give the regular axis of 180 and 90. When the patient comes for some goes elsewhere, they find out 175, 5 degree or instead of 90, they find out 85 or 95, they request for changing and the patient finds it very difficult to adjust to the new axis. So already we have cheated the eye with one axis, so should not cheat again. Cylinders induce meridional magnification in the axis of the cylinder. And vertical and horizontal meridional magnification is better tolerated than the oblique. So to reduce this meridional magnification, rotate the cylinder to the nearest 90 or 180 degree if possible. Or rotate towards the old axis because the patient has got used to it. The other option is to decrease the power of the cylinder. It's better to prefer same axis in both eyes if acceptable or go for the complementary axis. Full power of astigmatism is accepted only in the correct axis. So you find the axis of astigmatism by using Jackson cross cylinder, astigmatic fan or a stenopic slit. But nowadays the younger generation have not even seen the Jackson cross cylinder, they are not using it. Which is a very good uh, instrument to find out the axis of astigmatism. So what is done practically is manual rotation or rocking the cylinder method. In manual rotation, you rotate the cylinder in steps of 5 or 10 degrees in either direction and look for vision improvement. Make quick changes in the axis. A slow rotation is not well appreciated by the patient. Now when the power of the cylinder is very low, try with a higher cylinder, a higher by 0.5 or 0.75. After locating the axis, revert back to the correct strength. An intelligent patient finds the axis themselves when instructed to rotate the cylinder by them. I have seen many patients telling me, sir, let me try. He just makes a click movement and says, oh, this is my axis, oh, that's correct. Where usually the astigmatism is stationary, but if progressing, follow for development of keratoconus. Any astigmatism above 5, investigate for keratoconus. In presbyopia, never go by the age factor or rule of thumb. The profession of the patient and the working distance is the most important factor. You have to test both eyes separately because one eye may be having a refractive error like a manifest hypermetropia. Always do the distance correction first, then go for the near vision. Never overcorrect presbyopia. Overcorrection always leads to convergence difficulty and limitation of range of vision. It's always better to undercorrect. Here the dictum is the weakest convex lens which gives you clear vision, comfort and maximum working range. The most important factor is the maximum working range. Near ad should not produce any magnification. Many a time presbyopic patients ac accept little higher power because they say I am seeing things larger, magnified. They would like it. But it produces always convergence and accommodation, limitation of range of vision. Near ad more than 3.5 is rarely tolerated. The ideal near, near ad is plus 2.5 or 3 diopters. You may come across patients in the presbyopic age with a low degree of myopia and myopic astigmatism where they have not been using glasses for the whole years. For, see this, for this example, this patient, 42 year old, he had difficulty in earmark, is otherwise asymptomatic. He had a distance vision of 66, but on refraction he has got a minus 0.25 in odd axis in both eyes, a near ad of 1.25 N6. Here there is no need to insist on distance correction. He needs to give only plan of 1.25. Even if you give a distance correction, he is not going to use it. You should have extra care in prescribing pres uh, presbyopia for in tailors, priests, carpenters, goldsmiths, diamond workers and computer professionals because they have got varying working distance. And if you see a presbyopic patient pushing the glass down to the tip of nose, that means he is undercorrected. He, ha he needs more correction. Sometimes you come across patients with frequent changes in refraction. So the, here I had one patient two weeks back, 44-year-old female who was using 1.5 spherical plus 
with a near vision of plus 1.5 he was having 66 and n6 now he she says that glass is uncomfortable she cannot the distance is blurred and her near vision is also not clear on rechecking now he has got 66 vision plano and n which near vision is 1.5 so it was sent for signing the prescription then i thought why this is happening so i asked the patient history back again he is a diabetic and she stopped treatment for some time i asked her to check the blood sugar now itself the random blood sugar came as 500 so initially it was prescribed in the euglycemic stage now it has come hyperglycemia and the amount of plus one hypermetropia has been masked by the myopia produced by diabetes see this another patient 65 year old male he had 60 60 vision improved to 66 with plus 2.5 and a near at 2.5 he had n6 vision one month later he comes back saying the glass you prescribed is not suitable for me for both distance and near the new refraction is plus 3.566 and near at 2.5 n6 so here he took back the history after getting the new glass he got admitted to a hospital with chest pain he was investigated his blood sugar was 600 so the initial prescription was prescribed in the hyperglycemic stage patient didn't tell nobody took the history and when the hyperglycemia got control with treatment his glass was unsuitable so whenever you prescribe in an elderly patient always ask a history of diabetes and always make sure you see the value don't rely on the patient saying it's controlled make sure you see the value for blood sugar and, and prescribe only if it is reasonably controlled properly counsel the patient when wearing glasses for the first time when shifting to bifocals when shifting to progressives when they are changing the glass or the frame and changing the axis and warn all patients that they have to adapt to the new glasses you may use this rule liberally to be on the safer side if comfortable with the present glass continue the same don't undercorrect myopia give optimal full correction don't overcorrect myopia also and never overcorrect plus myopia don't effect minimal changes in the axis in post cataract patients better to prescribe after four weeks there's a trend among the younger generation of thalmodists to prescribe after two weeks the stability of vision comes only by about four to six weeks better to prescribe after four, six, four to six weeks there may be errors while writing the prescriptions which often happens because doctors are supposed to be poor mathematicians especially while adding the near ad you make a mistake writing a wrong axis commonly happens writing a wrong plus and minus sign usually happens interchanging the power between the right and the left eye and illegible prescription so be careful in writing the prescription and signing it somebody else writes for you and you sign it don't rely on prescriptions by people having connections with optical shops that's one thing which i advise you don't use prescription pads sponsoring any optical shop i've been working for 41 years i've never used a prescription pad or a letter pad having somebody else's name don't direct to a specific optical shop these things will boomerang to you sometime in your professional career aggressive counsel and avoid aggressive counseling don't aggressively counsel for bifocals if they are happy with a separate glass for distance and near don't force the patient to change to progressive if they are happy with a bifocal and don't prescribe if change is less than 0.5 diopter as it seldom diminishes asthenopic symptoms except in a very sensitive myope and a presbyope you may change a 0.25 diopter sometimes you see a patient coming to you with a shopping bag of full un unsatisfactory spectacles prescribed over the last six months given by x y z you may probably add on to the collection if you do it so try to counsel and help the patient combination your combination of your skill knowledge your timing and charisma may prevail to make the patient happy the most demoralizing and embarrassing statement my earlier spectacles were better try to avoid this feedback make sure to make sure to compare the vision with the present glass and the final trial lens before you prescribe it give the option to the patient to choose between the two if happy with the present glass don't insist on a change follow all the rules which have uh, shown above become a successful practitioner and revive the dying art of refraction 
Thank you for your patient listening. Uh, respected uh, Charles, sir, uh, it is, uh, I think, one of the best uh, oration lectures that I have uh, ever attended. It is full of practical pearls and, you know, I mean, on, on not only for young ophthalmologists, those of us who have been around for quite some time, we are going home with plenty of pearls. Thank you so much for your very illuminating oration, sir.